forward? To the right. Christian Ministries presents Start Our Sabbath. Oh, yeah. SOS, the live Friday night program to help you and your family start your Sabbath off right. You've had a tough week, and now it's time to relax and spend time with God's people from all around the world. That's why Wes and Nancy White invite you into their living room to relax and enjoy life. As always, We'll have lively Bible topics, and we'll examine current events. Your input is welcome. We want you to talk to us in our chat room. We want to hear your comments and your questions. So get your dinner and your Bible ready for tonight's show. I'm your announcer, Gary Gibbons. We're here in our studios in Big Sandy, Texas. And here is your host for Start Our Sabbath, Wes White. Good evening and welcome to our 68th episode of Start Our Sabbath, the show where we love bringing in the Sabbath with all of you out there in internet land. The seventh day Sabbath is such a wonderful gift from God and we're so blessed to celebrate this gift of rest week after week. And we know chances are you have had a tough week. We go through life, there are so many bad things and crazy things going on as we go through it in this age, and we, we just have to deal with it. Yeah, it's nuts out there. Right now, we've got people who want to ban plastic straws, but then we've got people who want to legalize plastic guns. Uh, and this <laughs> dichotomy says it all, doesn't it? Yeah, so we try to make our Sabbath show edifying and uplifting so that we can take our minds off of Satan's world. We want our show to be full of love for God and full of love for one another. And a little bit of fun, maybe. Yeah, and some fun. Jesus said that even though we are not of the world, we're stuck living in this world. World. And this is the very this is a very profane world that we're forced to reside in until Jesus returns to set up the new age. And how profane is this world? As one of our viewers wrote in to tell us, he said, trying to keep the Sabbath in an unholy environment is almost like trying to keep the Lord's Supper in a gentleman's club. Oh, and what does he know about that? Yeah. Uh, but God helps us through all this mess. Remember what Jesus told us in Matthew 11, 28. Yes, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my, my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In verse 30, he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So with that thought in mind, once again, we thank you for being here with us this evening. And remember, it's always our privilege to serve you. Now, we have an announcement to make regarding next Friday's show. And the announcement is this. There will be no show next Friday night. What? Nancy's birthday is August 28th. So we're going to spend time next Friday evening with some of our kinfolk. Do you honestly think people up north know what kinfolk means? All right, let me translate. We're going to spend time next Friday evening with some of our relatives. Is that better? Yeah, you've been living in Texas far too long. Yeah, and, and, and I've been told that by my Yankee relatives. And many times. Now, say, I'm Nancy, sure. why don't you read this nice birthday card that uh, I gave you? Do I have? Do. Please, everyone out there, they're, they're going to like it. Really? You think they're really going to like this? Yeah, come on. They're going to love it. Uh, Wes is such a romantic. <laughs> yeah. He wrote this card all by himself. Look at this. Great penmanship and everything. All right. <laughs> Ooh, after the date of your birth, on average, you get 77 years to live until you buy the great dirt farm and rest in peace. 
Today on your birthday, you moved up one step closer to the dirt farm. Happy birthday, Love West. Isn't that great? Yeah, I usually get better birthday cards from other people. But mine is more realistic. Hey, let's make a copy of this card and send it to Mimi. Mimi is always sending out cards. She might want to use this card. Uh, knock yourself out, but I don't think Mimi will have any use for this card. All right, speaking of Mimi, helping us out tonight uh, from the East Coast is the brilliant Carl Nachtrieb. And his main helper, Mimi, in Canada. Yeah, and Carl does a marvelous job on Facebook uh, as he connects Facebook to YouTube. That way, anyone without Facebook can watch the show by going to dynamicchristianministries.org and clicking on the link. Yes, they can, or they can pick up the YouTube feed at rldea.com. So thanks again, Carl, for your great work. Carl maintains both of our websites, dynamicchristianministries.org and rldea.com. Right. And Carl is the editor of your videos called uh, Answers for the 21st Century Thinker. That's right. Now, out on the West Coast, we have the other computer genius, which is Terry Lusenheim. That's right. Without Terry, there's no way we could have Bill on the show. No, so a big thank you to Terry. Let's open with prayer, shall we? Yes, let's do. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that Jesus Christ died for our sins so that we might have eternal life with you. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to celebrate your people of like mind. We thank you so much for your ecclesia, your called out ones. Help us, Father, to show love for all other people in the world. Help us to let our light shine so that others will know that we belong to Jesus. We are not to be a religion of condemnation, but we're to be a religion of love and mercy, tenderness and kindness. Help us to always remember to forgive our enemies of their sins and help us to show kindness for all people. Now be with us tonight um, in this Ecclesia meeting that's going on electronically around the world. We thank you so much, Father, for all that you give us, and we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Nancy's going to be doing some rushing. Now, uh, we are going to take a commercial break. Um, you, We haven't had commercial breaks before, have we? But we're going to have one tonight for the very first time. Here's our first commercial break. We'll see you on the other side in just 30 seconds. Which is worse, to declare something to be a sin when it's not? or to declare something to not be a sin when it is. One of the hardest things for a new Christian to understand is the fact that God does have standards. As a lifelong Christian, you may feel this sounds strange because some Christians believed in once saved, always saved. They say, I'm saved no matter what, so don't try to burden me with standards. Back in 1988, Ronald L. Dart gave a message entitled, God's standards, where he showed how you can determine what God's standards are. You can find this message and many more on the website of the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. Our website is rldea.com. Our website has many informative and interesting messages by the late Ron Dart, who was one of the most effective evangelists of the 20th century. Again, the title is God's Standards rldea.com we hope you like that that commercial was uh, put together by gary gibbons and carl nachtrieb didn't they do a great job on this now uh, before we get into our presentations we got three of them as usual nancy bill and me uh, we want to go to the mailbag because we have gotten some really, really good letters from y'all over the past several weeks, and I just wish that we could read them all. Uh, we've got them in the hopper for future reading because they're getting backed up, and we do want to share them with you because I really think that you're going to like all these letters that we've been getting. Hopper, you're going to use all the old world words you can think of. All the old I hopper. hope you, some of you young people know what a hopper is. Okay. Here, uh, well, here's a letter from David, and we're calling this person David. That's not his real name. David hasn't given us permission to use his name so we made up a fictitious name for him and i've got an assignment for you regarding this letter i want you uh, i want to hear your thoughts on david's letter so listen to the letter and then please talk to me in the chat room and tell me what you think about this letter now david's a catholic and we don't want to see any mean-spirited anti-catholic comments remember the catholics are not our enemies yeah catholics are not our enemy enemies personally my enemies there are two of them satan the devil and myself those are my two enemies, and I certainly don't look at any religious group as my enemy. Now, I disagree with a lot of religious groups, but they're not my enemy. And I hope that the love of God is in your heart and that you feel the same way. So as Nancy is reading David's letter, take note of it, 
And please give us your comments in the chat room, or you can write to me privately. My email address, as you know, is wdwhite49 at yahoo.com. All right, so here's what David says. Wes, I took the time to hear your latest Starter Sabbath. Of course, as a Bible-believing believing Catholic, the topic of the law is of interest to me. I want to address the oft-mentioned passage of Matthew 5.17. You said that to fulfill the law is not to destroy it, but to fulfill it. I agree. For example, neither of us would say that the law is destroyed just because we observe the Lord's Supper in lieu of the sacrificial rite of the Passover, and arguably on a different day. Even though we observe a brand new ritual and in a certain sense discard the old, the Passover is not destroyed but fulfilled. In a similar way, Christians throughout the world observe the Lord's Day, Sunday, in lieu of the Sabbath, Saturday. Even though it's a new day and, in a certain sense, we discard the old, the Sabbath is not destroyed but fulfilled. In both cases, Jesus is the fulfillment. He is our true Passover lamb who died to redeem sinners, and in him we find our true rest. In the, only, in, in the, one, in the one who deliberately and repeatedly made his post-resurrection appearances on the first day of the week. Again, neither of these practices destroy, but rather fulfill the law, with Jesus being the substance that casts the shadow. We might note that the apostles never claimed that Jesus explicitly said to stop all animal sacrifices in relation to the Passover, but we accept the implication and accept the Christian practice of the Lord's Supper instead. And though the apostles don't tell us explicitly in their writings that Sabbath observance was to, was to transition into the keeping of Sunday, we accept the implication of their first day of the week pra practices and accept the Christian observance of the Lord's Day instead. Does this make sense to you? Thanks for your time, David. Now, again, I don't agree with this, and I don't think you do, but I want to hear your thoughts on it. And I bring this up because I believe David is asking some sincere questions. He's not trying to be offensive. He said this is his understanding of the law, and, he, and I'd like for us to see if we can talk about this letter. We're not going to have time tonight. I was hoping we would, but we've got too much material. So we're going to have to do it in the next show in two weeks. So talk to us in the chat room. Give us your comments. We'll try to get into this towards the end of the show. Probably not. Not enough time. Or write to me. Uh, email me, wdwhite at wdwhite49 at yahoo.com. And again, we want to thank you all for your comments. We enjoy reading what you send us. Now, before we turn the show over to Nancy for her segment, I want to give you a quick update on the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. We just updated our website, rldea.com, and now it's mobile friendly. Isn't that great? Because before, when you went on it and looked at it, it was not so easy to see. And we know your, you people watch us on your phone. Yes, a lot of you are watching on the phone. So we got to send out a big thank you to Jeff Reed and Brandy Webb uh, for helping us out. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, so check out rldea.com. Let us know how you like the website. And again, we've added things we're always going to be adding. One final thing on the RLDEA, I have a meeting scheduled this coming Tuesday with Larry Watkins of Christian Educational Ministers, and I'm not sure what we're going to talk about, but I hope it's a productive uh, meeting. So tonight, I'm asking for your prayers on this. Please, okay. please ask God to guide every word that's said in the meeting. Ask God to help us to treat each other as Christians brothers and to do his word. W will you do that for us? Okay. Nancy, what have you got for us tonight? Take the wheel, sweetheart. Okay. Nancy, take the wheel. There we go. All right, let's see if I can get this going. On SOS number 66, Wes talked about what was nailed to the cross. The three things that were nailed to the cross, remember, were one, I should have tested you on this verse, one, Jesus, two, a sign saying, this is Jesus, King of the Jews, and three, the debt that's owed due to sin. On my segment tonight, I want to talk about the debt that is not nor ever could be nailed to the cross. This debt that I'm going to talk about remains open and owed. Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no man anything but, love, but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. This translation would seem to support the idea that we should not owe anything to anyone. Well, I like the NIV better on this scripture, which says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love to one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. There's a difference to my thinking in how these translations instruct me. The NIV seems to say that I do have an obligation to pay folks back what I owe, whether it's money or service or goods. 
It doesn't say you need to never have a debt or owe anything to anyone. It doesn't say you need to never be beholden to anyone. It doesn't say you are never to accept help. Rather, it tells me that when I do have a debt, I should pay it back in a timely manner and not let it remain outstanding. But there seems to be an even more important message here. This verse also tells me that the debt to love one another is impossible to pay back. It tells me that it remains owed no matter how many payments I make against the debt. I blogged about this on newchurchlady.org, and you can find that blog on the web back in the week of, of August 5th through the 11th. You go to newchurchlady.org and just a couple weeks ago. So if you want more details about the debt of love that we owe, please check that out. And let's make the following point clear. While I believe that that debt of love is an overarching debt to, to which all other debts must be subject, it isn't our only debt. It's not the only thing that God tells us we owe, even after Jesus' sacrifice nailed the debt of sin to the cross. And you're thinking right now, there's more? Really? Yep. Let's look at some of the other things that Scripture tells us that we still owe. First, I want to point out that I got all of these instructions based on looking up just one Greek word, and that one word was translated O in Romans 13, 8, O-W-E. Also, I'm not going to quote every scripture that uses this word. I don't have time for that tonight uh, to, to give you a comprehensive list, but I hope you'll find it to be a good start, and you can look it up again. That word is G3764 in Strong's, the Greek word ophilio, which can mean to owe, to owe money, to be in debt for, or that which is due. It's translated like ought or owe or be bound or be one's duty, be a debtor, be guilty, indebted, and things like that. So here's an admittedly incomplete list. First, let me reiterate that Romans 3, th th Romans 13, 8 tells us we owe love to others. And John repeats that in 1 John 4, 11, where he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Ought here is G3784. So please don't read it and think of it as, oh, we should, but rather think of it as, it is my duty to, or I owe this, or it's part of my debt to Jesus that I must do this thing. Here's another debt we owe and will always owe. We must wash one another's feet. John 13, 14 says, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. This ought here is G3784. We must always bear the burdens of the weak. Romans 15, 1. We then, are, <clears throat> we then that are strong ought to bear infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Ought here is G3784. Also, verse 7, it has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Duty here is from G3784. So if you think you're a Gentile, you still owe that. We always owe intimacy to our mates. That's the next one. 1 Corinthians 7.3 says, Let the husband render unto his wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife to the husband. Do here is G3784. Next, we owe hospitality to others. 3 John 1 7 says, We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. Ought here is G3784. If you read the previous verses, you see that we owe this debt, this debt of hospitality to people we know and to strangers. All right, the next one, we must lay down our lives for each other, not just in death, but in service while we live. 1 John 3, 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because we laid down, he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You guessed it, ought here is G3784. We can sum it all up in this. We must follow Jesus' exa Jesus's example in all things. 1 John 2, 6. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Must here is G3784. So you think maybe you got all that down pat, got it covered, do all those things, got it covered, those debts are being paid on, then I have one final scripture for you. Luke 17.10 So likewise you, when you have done all those things which are commanded of you, say we are unprofitable servants and we have done that which is our duty to do. The word duty here is translated from the same Greek word we've been reviewing in my section this evening. So this reminds me that the duty to love that I owe the Father, Jesus, and my fellow man, this debt of love, it's only a starting point. 
Because of God's love and Jesus' sacrifice, because of the mercy and forgiveness we have received, we owe to our fellow man not only love, but, but we do owe love, not only love, but service, hospitality, help in time of need, and much, much more. I'm human, and as long as I'm in this mortal flesh, all of that debt remains open and due because it's too great for me to pay off in this human lifetime. Praise God that he offers us all eternity to keep paying on that debt. Maybe we can at least pay down the interest a little, given all eternity to work on it. As always, I welcome your thoughts, comments, and questions, and you can write me at nancy at dynamicchristianministries.org. Very good, sweetheart. Thank you. We're going to set up for uh, Bill's segment right now, but first I want to remind you of something. Uh, the, uh, Bill is um, the guy who runs the Facebook page Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. It's awesome. He's got like over 18,000 followers. So if you haven't checked out Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers, uh, get with it because you're missing out on some really, really good stuff. Uh, I also want to remind you of something. I, I mentioned this just a minute ago, and that is that um, we never ask you for money. Uh, people want to send us money, and we don't accept money. If you send us money, we're going to send it right back. So don't send us money. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have to pay postage on it. Um, don't give us money, but we do ask you for things. We ask you, first of all, for your prayers, because we believe in prayer, and we need your prayers because we want God to guide us. We're not perfect. We make mistakes, and we want to do the best that we humanly can. So please pray for us. And even if you're one of those people who are sitting out there that can't stand the show, pray for us anyway. Pray that God will help us to do the right thing. Also, we ask that you hit the share button because uh, if this show is beneficial to you, it's probably going to be beneficial to other people as well. So please uh, hit the share button. Uh, also, uh, let's see if there's one other thing. Uh, Nancy tells me we've got Bill on the line. Bill, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Wes. Great to be with everybody here live, live and not dead, live and living color here in our West Coast studios. Fantastic. And as always, we are so glad to have you here, Bill. And uh, we just put up a sign on the screen, and people are wondering if I'm dissing you because the sign says, shut up. You've seen the sign. And they're thinking I'm saying horrible things about you already. Uh, hey, Wes, hold on just a second. We have a little technical difficulty here. Okay. Maybe my sign offended Bill. It is. A little technical. All right, Bill got a break. Good. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we hear you great. All right, very good. Okay. What do you got for us tonight, Bill? I'm sorry, Wes. We're getting some feedback here. Okay. Live this will TV. Just, this will just take a second. Okay. I'm so glad we're not broadcasting this. <laughs> we're live, honey. All right, very good. All right, I think we're... I okay. What have you got for us tonight, Bill? Okay, everyone is telling us in the chat room that you can't hear Bill. 
that's what we get for getting him a new microphone. So uh, Nancy, take him off. Lips. Okay. So uh, this is live TV. Okay. Uh, why don't we at this point, um, let's do uh, one of our uh, other special features that we wanted to have tonight. Are you ready, Nancy, to zoom in on this? All right, here's something special for you tonight. Dart Evangelistic Association presents Answers for the 21st Century Thinker. Borders between cities and counties and states and nations are really important. The Bible talks about borders and property lines. And the American Midwest has some fascinating history regarding its borders. Hi, I'm Wes White. And welcome to another Answers to the 21st Century Thinker at RLDEA.com. Let's go to Marinette, Michigan. I'm standing in Egg Harbor, Wisconsin, overlooking this beautiful body of water called Green Bay. And across this bay is the city of Menominee, Michigan. Now, my guess is that most people in Menominee don't even realize that their city was once part of Wisconsin. You see, Wisconsin used to be a lot bigger than it is now. But two strange things happened in American history that forever changed the borders of Wisconsin. First of all, in 1837, the state of Ohio was at war with the state of Michigan. Yes, two states had actually declared war on each other. And what were Ohio and Michigan fighting over? They were fighting over Toledo. They both claimed ownership of the city of Toledo. Now, it was a short war, a bloodless war, because the United States Congress quickly stepped in and they made the decision that Toledo would belong to Ohio. Well, this decision infuriated Michigan, so Congress had to do something to make up for Michigan's loss of Toledo. So, what did the Congress do? They gave Michigan a big chunk of territory of Wisconsin. And that's why so much of the state of Michigan exists on both sides of Lake Michigan. Wisconsin used to own all the land that was west of Lake Michigan. And that's why the city of Menominee across the bay is in Michigan and is no longer in Wisconsin. And this loss of land wasn't the first time that poor Wisconsin was on the losing end. Back in 1818, Illinois was about to become a state. And that state, at the time, their southern boundary of Wisconsin came all the way down south to what is now Calumet City, Illinois. Yes, in those days, the territory of Wisconsin included what is now the entirety of the city of Chicago and its suburbs. But Wisconsin had to give up these southern lands to Illinois. Now, why was that? Because in 1818, when Illinois was about to become a state, many anti-slavery folks had a major concern. At that time, the new state of Illinois would have had many, many people in the southern part of the state who were from Kentucky, people who were sympathetic to slavery. So the anti-slavery people were worried that Illinois might become a slave state with all these Kentucky transplants living and voting in southern Illinois. And it was for this reason that the United States Congress moved the border of Illinois north to where it is today, and this added thousands of anti-slavery people to the new state of Illinois. And by doing so, they took away a big chunk of land from Wisconsin. Again, poor Wisconsin got the short straw. Had it not been for the needs of Michigan in 1837 and the needs of Illinois in 1818, Wisconsin would be a much larger state today. Now, isn't this the way life is? It's very seldom that there's ever truly a win-win situation after we see a conflict like this. Most of the time, when things have to be done for the greater good, someone ends up winning and someone ends up losing. In other words, in life, someone has to be Wisconsin. This happens not only in countries and states, it happens in families and schools and businesses and communities and in personal relationships. 
And the reason a disagreement usually ends up with a loser is because people are almost always fighting over limited resources. In other words, since everyone can't get what they want, ultimately someone's got to be Wisconsin. Well, the good news is it won't be this way in the world tomorrow when Jesus returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the kingdom of God on this earth, there's going to be virtually unlimited resources. For example, right now there's so much of the earth that's uninhabitable, like deserts and mountains. In the future, this won't be the case because the prophecies in the Bible tell us that Jesus is going to transform the entire earth to make it all habit habitable. He's going to make the deserts bloom. He's going to level the mountains. He's going to make it so that the harvester will overtake the plowman. The entire earth is going to be back to the being like it was in the Garden of Eden. This is what Moses wrote about in the book of Genesis. Yes, Wisconsin is a beautiful state, but it's going to be even more beautiful after the return of Jesus. In fact, the whole world will be more beautiful. If you enjoyed this presentation, feel free to check out our website, rldea.com, the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. We've got all kinds of studies and messages from the late Ronald L. Dart that can help you in your daily life. And we'll see you next time on Answers for the 21st Century Thinker at rldea.com. Answers for the 21st Century Thinker is a production of the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. For more information, please visit our website, rldea.com. We hope you enjoyed that. Uh, this thing was put together mostly by uh, Carl Nachtrieb. He did most of the editing on it. Uh, the beginning and the end, these, um, in, the intro and the closing, that was put together by Terry Lusenheide. So we've had a lot of people's hands in this. We hope you enjoyed it. All right, let's get into our next presentation. I'd like to begin this segment by talking about lions. Now, we all know that humans are in a totally different category than the creatures in the animal kingdom. Also, humans are totally in a totally different category than angels. Now, what is it that makes us different from both animals and angels? Two things. The first is that we are made in the image of God. And the second, our destiny is to be reborn into the God family and live forever with our Heavenly Father and our elder brother, Jesus Christ. Now, when we say that this is our destiny, we're not preaching universal salvation. There are going to be some who reject the opportunity to live forever with God and Jesus and we don't have any idea who those people are. We can't judge. We have no idea what the number of people is that are going to reject this. In other words, just because living with God eternally is everyone's destiny, that doesn't mean that we're all going to achieve that destiny. And we can say that with, with assuredness because we know from Bible prophecy that some are going to reject God's wonderful gift of grace. All right, let's get back to the differences between the humans and the animals. In spite of the major differences between us and animals, we have to acknowledge that humans and animals have some similarities. And here's an example. Like all other warm-blooded animals, we humans have hearts, we have brains, eyes, ears, cardiovascular systems, and things like digestive systems. And during most of man's history, the desire of every man to produce offspring from his own bloodline from his own DNA, that, that desire throughout history is it, it, like some kind of a primal urge, not too dissimilar from what animals have. Let's go back to the animal kingdom. Now here's an example of animal kingdom desire to reproduce one's own DNA. If some male lion has a pride with, say, maybe a dozen female lions and a bunch of offspring baby lions, Sometimes an outside male lion will challenge him for ownership of that pride. So the two lions fight it out. Now, suppose the outside lion that comes in wins the, the, the fight. Suppose he kills the original owner of the pride. Well, then after the new lion takes over, does he then adopt 
All the little baby lions that are in the pride? Absolutely not. His first step is to kill every baby lion in that pride because the deaths of all those baby lions will cause all the lionesses of that pride to go into heat. And then the new male leader of the pride gets to procreate with all these lionesses and thereby continue his bloodline, his DNA, through all the new births that result. Again, adoption is not part of the thinking of this new male leader of the pride. During most of man's existence, adoption was not looked at the way we look at it today. In our contemporary times, it's nothing for a couple to adopt a baby from Russia or Mexico or Africa or from even from within the United States. When this couple gets the baby home, they love it. They treat it as though it's part of their own bloodline. They make absolutely no differentiation, and this is wonderful. But this is a relatively new phenomenon in human history. For the most part, adoption was not that popular in ancient cultures. In ancient times, like the male lion, most people wanted their children to come from their own loins, as the Bible would say. And probably the most notable exception to this ten tendency of adopting uh, you know, people only in extended family was Joseph the stepfather of Jesus. Joseph not only married Mary, even though she was pregnant with a child that wasn't his, Joseph also risked his own life to rescue Mary and Jesus by taking them down to Egypt. Joseph could have taken an easy way out and had nothing to do with Mary after he learned of her pregnancy. And, and in his culture, no one would have condemned him for walking away. Instead, Joseph did a beautiful thing by showing love for Mary and Jesus by taking care of them. And this very well could have happened simply because God told him to. The point is this. Joseph's actions regarding the adoption of Jesus were unique in those times. Again, today, we look at adoption as a wonderful thing, which it is. Today, adoption keeps babies from being orphans, and adoption reduces abortion, which is evil. So this situation with Joseph that we see is exceptional in the Bible, and it's exceptional in ancient Eastern times in general. So tonight, as we look at this concept of adoption, please keep in mind that adoption back in Bible days was not necessarily looked at as a bad thing per se. Rather, adoption was looked at as an inferior way to grow the family because Bloodlines meant everything to most of those people back then. And as you keep this concept in mind, also please remember this, uh, the, the following. And I've been harping on this for years. Those of you who hear me teach regularly know that I keep reminding you over and over that the Bible is not a Western book. It's an Eastern book. It's an Asiatic book. And I keep saying that because the problem with so many Christians is that we look at the Bible through Western eyes. We want to see God's written word as a Western document, and it's not. The Bible's not a Catholic document. The Bible's not a Protestant document. God's word was written by an Eastern people of the Hebrew race and of the Hebrew religion. So please stop looking at the Bible from a Catholic or Protestant or European or modern or Western point of view. Now, here's one of the big problems with America's version of Christianity. Too many Christians don't understand that the New Testament does not exist in a vacuum. The New Testament is based on the Old Testament. Further, Jesus and his disciples were Hebrews who followed the laws of the Old Testament. And again, we're going to talk about those 613 laws that we find in the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There are 613 laws in the first five books of the Bible. And God willing, we're going to talk about those 613 laws three weeks from tonight. Again, on this show, we have a problem with so much of Christian thinking out there because here's how American Christianity has evolved. Christianity was founded by a Jewish rabbi by the name of Yeshua. He followed Old Testament laws. Then the Greeks got a hold of the gospel and they turned it into a philosophy. Then the Romans got a hold of the gospel. They turned it into a government. Then the Europeans got a hold of the gospel. They turned it into a culture. 
and then the Americans got a hold of the gospel and they turned it into a money-making business. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm not talking just about the health and wealth guys like Joel Osteen. I'm also talking about Sabbath-keeping ministers who have used God's truth to make tons and tons of money. He that hath an ear, let him hear. And it gets worse. Today, Americans are wrecking the gospel even more because Americans are taking the gospel and they're turning it into a political party. And again, I'm not restricting this problem to just guys out there, guys like Ralph Reed and Jerry Falwell. I'm including Sabbath-keeping ministers by pointing out how some Sabbath-keeping ministers are turning Christianity into a political party. And all of these things that I've just described, what the Greeks did, what the Romans did, what the Europeans did, what the Americans are doing, it's all wrong. It's all a fake gospel. And all of it should be avoided like the plague by the ecclesia. We've got to go back to our roots. Now, I'm not saying we should all become messianics. I'm not saying that we need to join the sacred names movement. I'm not saying that. I'm just reminding you that Jesus did not come to create a new religion. Jesus came to be the Messiah of a religion that we see taught in the Old Testament. And I got to say that again because it bears repeating, bears repeating. Jesus did not come to create a new religion. Jesus came to be the Messiah of the religion that we see taught in the Old Testament. Again, we're going to talk about the 613 laws of the Torah in a few weeks. Now, let's set the stage for adoption. In our society today, adoption is a great thing. So let's continue to applaud and encourage and praise those parents who adopt children. But again, adoption was not celebrated in ancient times like it is today. In Genesis 22.2, write that down. Genesis 22.2, God talks to Abraham about Isaac, about Isaac, and God calls Isaac, Abraham's son, his only son. Whoa, wait a minute. God calls Isaac Abraham's only son? What about Ishmael? We know from previous scriptures that Ishmael had already been born by the time of this Genesis 22, verse 2 thing. Ishmael was clearly Abraham's seed, but Ishmael didn't have all the right DNA in him. Sure, he had Abraham's DNA, but he didn't have Sarah's DNA. And Sarah's DNA was necessary for Abraham's true heir because God had made promises to both Abraham and Sarah. To help us better understand why God said that Isaac was Abraham's only son, we've got to get back to our point that the Bible is an Asiatic book, not a modern, not a modern Western book. We've got to remember that in the Hebrew culture, the quote-unquote designated son was more than just a designated son. He was also a representative of his father. The designated son was the heir to the father. The designated son was the one who was going to take over from the father. The designated son represented a special place within the mind of the father and within the mind of the entire clan, the extended family. So even though Ishmael was born first, he was not that designated son. Isaac was. So when God called Isaac, Abraham's firstborn, had nothing to do with chronology. It had everything to do with his rank within the Abrahamic family structure. Now, this designated son role was usually given to the firstborn. We know that Ishmael was chronologically firstborn, but he didn't get the special designation. Esau was the firstborn, but he didn't get that special designation. Jacob got that. Reuben was the firstborn, but he didn't get that special des designation. It went to Judah. And Adam was the firstborn. He was supposed to get this special designation, but he blew it. He disqualified himself when he sinned in the garden, and that's why the prophecy in Genesis 3.15 had to take place, this plan of redemption that we see in the earliest parts of the book of Genesis. And this is why Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. We find that in 1 Corinthians 15. So this business of sonship is really an important thing in the Bible. And it's important to note that no adopted sons ever got to be in the role of being the designated son. 
And that's why some people get this question mark in their heads when the New Testament starts talking about our being adopted. We, we have several scriptures that talk about, quote unquote, our adoption. And I'm telling you that this whole concept of Christians being adopted is bogus. Some of the Bible translators got it wrong, and that's what we need to dig into tonight. But first, before we get into that, I want to remind you, we don't ask for money. Uh, we ask you to hit the share button. Same with the uh, Ronald L. Dart Evangelist Association. We don't accept any money over there. Uh, but we do ask you for prayers. We believe in the power of prayer. We ask you to hit the share button. Okay, we've been, been down this road. And this brings us to another point. I know some of you want to donate to worthwhile ministers, but sometimes you don't know what ministries are going to use your tithes and offerings effectively and properly. And so some people want to know, well, if I can't send money to DCM, I can't send money to RLDEA, where can I send my contributions? Well, let me give you an option tonight. Now, this is not a request that you give money to this church. I'm not trying to hit you up for money. I'm only answering the question for those who want recommendations on where you can send your contributions. I recommend that you consider sending your money, or some money, a little bit of money, to the uh, Church of God Seventh Day in Tyler, Texas. And let me be really, really clear on this. Nancy and I attend there usually a couple times a month. We're involved in their music program. We try to help them out wherever we can. Right now, they need to expand because they're outgrowing their building. They need a bigger place to move to. So if you want to send donations to a group that has love, that helps the poor, that preaches the gospel, feeds the flock, feel free to send your contributions to Church God Seventh Day, 12513 Chapman Road. That's 12513 Chapman Road, Tyler, Texas, 75708. And never think that Nancy and I get any of this money that you might send over Church God Seventh Day and Tyler. We don't get a piece of the action. We don't get a cut. We're not on their salary. We just enjoy attending church with those, folk, with those folks who regularly show love to God, to God's law, and to other people. Nancy and I thoroughly enjoy fellowshipping with the Church of God Seventh Day in Tyler, Texas. Okay, let's get back to our examination of this concept of adoption. And let's look at some scriptures in the New Testament. Because remember that when all of this stuff started, it began when we started looking at misconceptions about the books of Galatians and Colossians. And we've been doing that for, what, two, three weeks now. Tonight, we're going to look at one of those misconceptions. We talk about this adoption thing. Let's read from Galatians. Galatians 4, 5. Write that down. Galatians 4, 5. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption to sonship. Okay. Ephesians 1, 5 says, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Let's also look at Romans 8.15. Write this down, Romans 8.15. And let's read this from the King James because I think there's a lesson we can learn from this poor translation of the word adoption. It says in Romans 8.15, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 17, finally it says, and if, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, together we might be glorified. But Romans 8.23, let's continue, jump down some verses. Romans 8.23, it says, Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inward, in, <coughs> excuse me, inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption, the sonship, the redemption of our bodies. I'm telling you, this word adoption is really an, an unfortunate translation. And I say unfortunate, unfortunate because when we talk about adoption, we're talking about bringing a child home from the orphanage. And again, there's nothing wrong with bringing a kid home from the orphanage. Adoption, as we said, is a good thing. But we in the church aren't adopted. We're not brought home from the orphanage. We're brought home from the hospital. Because with the Holy Spirit, we're eventually reborn into the family of God. 
The Holy Spirit gives us God's actual divine DNA. Luke 20, verse 36, write this down. Luke 20, 36. And they, meaning Christians, can no longer die, for they are like angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. Again, conversion to Christianity is not an adoption process. Conversion to Christianity is becoming part of the God family due to the Holy Spirit being within us. Now, let me interject something important. I want to read two very important scriptures. I mean two really, really important scriptures. The first scripture is the plan of God on this earth. It's the purpose statement of the Bible. Those of us who took speech classes, we were taught, what's your SPS? What's your specific purpose statement? This is the SPS of the Bible. It tells us what God's creation is all about. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Write that down. Genesis 1, 27. God created mankind in his image. Now, he says it once, but he wants to say it again. So he says, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female created them. Twice he says, in his image. This scripture shows why God created man. He made man and woman in his image to be like him. Now here's our second important scripture. The second scripture is the plan of salvation for mankind after man sinned in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3.15, write that down. Genesis 3.15. And God says, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring, Babylon, and hers, Jesus. He, Jesus, will crush your head, in other words, a fatal blow, and you will strike his heel. That is a wounding through the crucifixion. Again, the plan of God and the plan of salvation can be summed up in just these two verses of the Bible. And fortunately, we don't have to rely only on these two verses to understand God's plan of salvation and the plan for mankind. There's so many other parts in the Bible that talk about these two things. And these two verses tie in with the fact that once we have the Holy Spirit within us, we now have God's spiritual DNA within us. Unlike an adopted child who has no bloodline connection to his parents, we do. We have the same spiritual blood flowing through our veins as does our Heavenly Father and as does our elder brother, Jesus of Nazareth. And, and, and come on, none of this should surprise us. When I sometimes talk about God being our Father and Jesus being our elder brother and we're all in a family, sometimes people are shocked, but they shouldn't be. Don't we find passage after passage about how we have a God who is our Father? I mean, we've already read Luke 20, 36. And then, then let's take Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In the sixth chapter of Matthew, Jesus tells us, he said, all right, here's how you pray, y'all. This is what you do. You start off by saying this, our Father, which art in heaven, or a better translation might be our heavenly Father. Then Hebrews 2, 11 and Romans 8, 29, write that down. Hebrews 2.11 and Romans 8.29 state very clearly that Jesus is indeed our elder brother. God is a family. And you and I were called to be in that family to live with our father and our elder brother forever. And we should never believe that we're in that family because we have been adopted into it. No, we're born into the family of God. We have the, our father's DNA in our veins through the Holy Spirit, we are of the same bloodline. And see, this is the very reason why Psalm 82, 6 says, you are gods. Write that down, Psalm 82, 6. It says, you are gods. And this is the very reason why Jesus quotes Psalm 82, 6 when he says in John 10, 34, write this down, John 10, 34, Jesus says, is it not written in your law, I have said, you are gods? Question, were you created in the image of God for the purpose of being reborn into the angel family? No, no, we're totally different species from the angels. All right, were you created in the image of God for the purpose of being reborn into the dog family? Were you created in the image of God for the purpose of being reborn into the cattle family? No, we're totally different species from the animals. 
You and I were created in the image of God for the purpose of being reborn into the God family. And this is what the plan of salvation is all about. Now, we've been talking about this fallacy that the that Galatians and Colossians are antinomian books. Remember that antinomian means against the law. And some say that these two books, Galatians, Colossians, show that God's law has been done away with. Well, we've shown in previous shows how Galatians and Colossians are not antinomian. We've talked about it over, what, the last two or three weeks. Been talking about antinomian, antinomianism and how it is not found in Galatians and Colossians. So at this point, let's stay on the antinomianism thing. Let's look at it from a little different perspective because I got a call this week from my buddy Dennis. And Dennis brought up an interesting concept I'd like to share with you. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Let's set the stage here. We're going to set the stage. Some time ago on SOS, didn't we go into great detail on the phrase, son of God or sons of God? Didn't, didn't we talk about that in great length? I, if I remember correctly, we showed that when the Bible uses the phrase son of God or sons of God, it doesn't always mean the same thing. In different contexts, it means different things. And this misunderstanding of the definition, people think there's only one definition of son of God or sons of God. This misunderstanding is why some people fall into the trap of believing that the sons of God mentioned in Genesis 6-2 were angels and that the pre-flood Nephilim giants were offspring of angels. And I'm sorry, that's bogus. Anyway, Nancy, didn't we come up with like eight or ten different Bible definitions for the term son of God or sons of God? Was that on SOS or was it on, that on bots? I can't remember. Uh, it was SOS, okay. It's the same with the phrase son of man. Son of man doesn't have a single definition in God's word. Let's set the stage a little bit more for where we're going because there's this incident that leads up to our discussion of the term son of man. Jesus and the disciples, they're eating some grain on the Sabbath. A little historical footnote. They weren't eating corn as we know it. When we think of corn, we think of maize, ears, you know, ears of corn. That type of corn wasn't known to Jesus and the disciples. That type of corn didn't arrive in Asia, Africa, and Europe until after 1492 when Columbus discovered what we now call the Americas. Columbus learned about corn from the Native Americans, and he brought corn or maize back to the old world. So Jesus and the disciples weren't eating corn. They were eating wheat. All right, let's get to the important point. That was historical trivia. When we talk about the Sabbath as it relates to the New Testament, a lot of people want to say that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And when they say that, they quote Matthew 12, 18 and Mark 6, 5. Write that down. Matthew 12, 8 and Mark 6, 5. But neither one of these scriptures reads as follows. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. It does not say that. Each one of these gospel scriptures says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And most people assume, they say, well, we know that Jesus was talking about himself in these two scriptures. Therefore, these scriptures are saying, in essence, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Mm, not so fast. Let's, let's hold off before we come to that conclusion. Let's acknowledge that many, many New Testament scriptures refer to Jesus as the Son of Man. Lots of them. And we can find stuff in the Old Testament that refers to Jesus as the Son of Man, like this one, Daniel 7.13, one of my favorite Old Testament scriptures. Write that down. Daniel 7.13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented for him, before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And this is a beautiful scripture that shows that, a, that our Savior is a different being than the Father. They are two different entities. Now, when we see all these references to Jesus as Son of Man, they're there because they're showing us that Jesus was definitely a human being. Prior to Jesus' birth, he was God because he's always existed. You and I have no eternal preexistence. We were created one day. Jesus, like his father, had no date of creation. Like his father, he, he, was, he always existed. And then there came a point in history where Jesus emptied himself of his divinity so that he could live for 33 and a half years as a mortal who suffered and died just like the rest of us. 
So when we see the phrase son of man being applied to Jesus, that's what that's all about. It's showing us that he really existed in the flesh and he wasn't just some mist or shadow like a lot of people back then after he died, they claimed he was. They said he wasn't in the flesh. He was like a mist or a shadow. I like this from theologian C.F.D. Mole, M-O-U-L-E. You can look it up. Mole argues that the phrase son of man is among the most important symbols used by Jesus himself to describe his vocation. Did you catch that? This guy's saying that Jesus' vocation on this earth was to live as mortal man. I think that's cool. So it's good that we recognize Jesus as, as son of man to show that he was really flesh and blood and not a mist or a phantom or something. But we've got to remember when we're doing this that the phrase son of man in the Bible doesn't always mean Jesus. Remember, we got to think uh, like the Eastern Asiatic people and not like Western European or Americans. The Hebrew expression son of man is in, in the Hebrew, not in the Greek, but in the Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word ben adam. Ben adam appears, now get this number, 107 times in the Old Testament, 107 times. And what it does most of the time, 93 times, this phrase, son of man, ben Adam, it shows up in the book of Ezekiel. And in the book of Ezekiel, this phrase ben Adam is used in three different ways. First, as a form of address to Ezekiel. In some of these verses, son of man in Ezekiel does not refer to Jesus or the father. It refers to a human, a prophet named Ezekiel. Second, the phrase is used in the book of Ezekiel to contrast the lowly status, status of fleshly humanity against the eternity of God in the angels. We see this demonstrated in Numbers 23:19 and Psalm 8:4. Write that down. Numbers 23:19, Psalm 8:4. And third, the phrase son of man is used to refer to a future eschatological figure whose coming will signal the end of history and the time of God's judgment. We find that in Daniel 8.17. Write that down, Daniel 8.17. It refers to the end time Messiah who's going to rule in this new age that we talk about so much on this show. Again, the Old Testament has at least three different definitions for son of man. Son of man doesn't always mean Jesus. Now, no, no, get this. Antinomians love to say that the phrase son of man in Matthew 12, 8 and Mark 6, 5, they love to say that refers to Jesus. And the reason they love this so much is that they then use it as an argument to say the following. They say this. Yes, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Therefore, Jesus can change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Or even further, Jesus has the authority to do away with the Sabbath altogether. That's what they say. Yes, the antinomians use Matthew 12, 8 and Mark 6, 5 to do away with the Sabbath. And this is wrong. We know that for, for many reasons. Don't have time to get into all of them. And this gets really interesting if you take into account what my friend Dennis says. In these two particular gospel passages... Dennis says that Jesus is not claiming the title of son of man in these two passages. He's not claiming ownership over the Sabbath. He's not claiming the right to change the Sabbath. He's not claiming the authority to do away with the Sabbath. That's what he's saying. Now, let me carry Dennis's thought to what I think is its logical conclusion. Now, this is me talking. I don't want you to think I'm putting words in Dennis's mouth. If my friend Dennis is correct on this point, then this is what Jesus just might be saying in Matthew 12, 18, 12, 8, and Mark 6, 5. He might be saying this. The Sabbath was created for mankind. The Sabbath was created to help man. God's intent in creating the Sabbath was not to tie man's hands so that his life will be miserable. Therefore, if your ox falls into a ditch, pull it out to keep that poor animal from suffering. And while you have no business harvesting your fields on the Sabbath, if you're hungry on the Sabbath, pull off some pieces of wheat on the Sabbath so you can be nourished and strengthened. Don't inflict suffering on yourself because you think that the Sabbath is some kind of a burden that keeps you from eating. That's not God's intent. So, while the Son of Man in this case meaning mankind, not Jesus. So while the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, mankind is Lord of the Sabbath in this phraseology, it's still God's law. 
It can only be done away with by God. It can't be voided by mankind. It can't be voided by the church or, or by, by whoever. It's still in effect, but it's there for the Son of Man to serve him and for him to be Lord over. Now, by the way, Ron Dart uh, wrote a book that talks about things like God's eternal preexistence. It's called The Lonely God. And I believe you can get it on Amazon.com. And I believe you can also get it from Wasteland Press because they're the ones who are the publishers of the book. And, and I'm not sure about Wasteland Press. If anybody out there knows the answer to this, let me know. Because I know you can get it at Amazon, but I think you can get it cheaper at Wasteland Press. Again, the book is called The Lonely God. All right, let's, let's end this. The Son of Man, it, it, this whole thing about the Son of Man, it, it, this is a little different take on these two scriptures. And again, on this show... We're always trying to give you things to think about because I'm not going to spoon feed you and tell you, well, this is the way you're supposed to think. No, you, you've got to come up with your own understanding, your own conclusions. You've got the Holy Spirit just like I do. I'm only here to help you. Let's remember this. This is important. When the day comes that you're going to stand in judgment and your judgment is upon you, I'm not going to be there at your side. Your minister's not going to be there. You're on your own. So you've got to make your own decisions on your own actions, and you've got to make your own decisions on your beliefs. And that's why, and that's why we're always quoting Philippians 2.12 that says you've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I don't own you. You're not my property. No minister owns you. All right, let me hear your thoughts about this stuff that we just talked about. Remember, we won't be here um, next Friday evening, August 24th. Uh, we'll be back, God willing, in two weeks on August 31st. We're going to talk about David's letter. Uh, you can email me, wdwhite49 at yahoo.com, or Dennis's uh, thing if you want to email me about that. And then hopefully on September 7th, we can talk about the 613 laws of the Torah. You know, which ones, excuse me, are done away with and which ones are still to be kept today. Nancy, what do you got for us in the chat room tonight? Did I put him to sleep? Okay, David Lacey did uh, post a link to Amazon if you want to get the book. Thank you, David. Um, Peter came and said a lot of uh, what is in the long paper I sent you. I don't... Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, Peter came and sent me a really, really long paper, and I'm still trying to, trying to understand it. Yeah. Remember, I am not a theologian. I'm not a linguist. Um, I'm just a guy like you, so bear with me if I'm a little a bit slow on some of this stuff. guy who studies his Bible. Guy, I'm just a guy who studies his Bible. Uh, Marita Reese says, good study, Wes. Thank you, Marita. Richard Maxwell says, but Jesus didn't do away with the Sabbath, and there's no scriptural evidence that he did. Absolutely. Who said that? Uh, Richard Maxwell. Thank you, Richard. And Excellent. he also says it's good to do well on the Sabbath. That's right. That's, that's right. Jesus, that's because Jesus healed that guy on the Sabbath. That's and right. And we talked about that on the show. How he said, take up your bed and walk. Mm -hmm. And his bed wasn't a four-poster, king-size bed. It was like a sleeping bag. and all But, the, but it was still against uh, the, the pharisaical law. laws. It wasn't That's against right. God. There's nothing in the Old Testament that says you can't pick up a sleeping bag right. and walk off right. of it. That was the pharisaical law. We talked about that. I won't bore you with it again. Uh, Mark Paula Reinhardt says, we will become a God in the family just as Jesus is God in the family. Thank you. Very good. And Sharon Lewis points out, God is our father and Christ is our brother. Three exclamation points. We'll take that. Three exclamation <laughs> points. Very good. Thank you, Sharon. Is Sharon the one in Jamaica? Uh, well, sometimes she's in Jamaica. Okay. All right. Sharon, you can tell us where you are tonight. I think you're in Jamaica. She yeah. said, also says truth is sweeter than honey and uh, than honey in the honeycomb. Yeah, we do love God's truth, don't we? Mm -hmm. and, and again, we love it not because we're out there trying to beat people over the head with it. We don't look at other people and say, oh, we've got this truth, and you're nothing, and we're great. No, no, no. It's like we've got this. We're very appreciative. Um, if you want to hear this, we'd love to share it with you. But th this truth that we have understanding of, it's limited. It's not infinite. There are other people who have other truths that we don't have. That's right. We're seeing through a glass darkly. Okay. On YouTube, Carl says that uh, you can't get it at Wasteland Press. You cannot. No. Oh, that's too bad. No. Because I, I, you know. I'm going to have to contact them because they should be selling it from Wasteland. Okay. They're a print-on-demand publisher. Why wouldn't they sell them? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. Um, Debbie says uh, she her handle is Jesus spoke to me last night. Uh, people interpret new covenant to mean new religion. 
That's right, they do. Thank uh, you, that's a good comment. It's not a new religion. Uh, Bill Evans said some COGs are nothing more than an arm of certain of a certain political party. <laughs> okay, who and said I that? cleaned that up a good deal. He says. Who, who said that? Bill Evans. Bill Evans. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> I bet you did have to kind of tidy that up, knowing Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. And we Debbie, love you, Bill. And Debbie uh, also says <laughs> Hebrews one should clear up the idea that sons of God aren't a angels. So yes. there you go. You can Very read good. Hebrews one. Hebrews one. Thank you. Great comments tonight. Not a lot tonight, but they're great ones. Uh, well, I'm, I'm doing my best to get them read. Um, Jeffrey Flum posted uh, Galatians 4.24, uh, which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants and then um, the rest of the scripture there. Okay. I won't read it because you can go to Galatians uh, 4.24 and 4.23, which he also posted. And, oh, I'm looking backwards. So 4.22 to 24. Okay. And Jeffrey, <laughs> yours is one of the letters that I'm, I've got in the uh, queue yes. or in the hopper that, I'm, that I wanted to get. I had it to go tonight, but we had too much material, so I had to pick it up, cut it and paste it and move it into next and week's show. I even hope. without Bill, we went after Even without nine. Bill. Because you know these... Um, um, 21st century thinkers, I forgot. They're like a four or five minute thing. Oh, and so, so, so Bill gave up his time for 21st century He thinker. didn't mean to, but he did. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Sorry, sorry. Bill. We'll yeah, get sorry, that Bill. fixed so we yeah. can do that. And, ne and next week you can tell us, or week, in, in two, two weeks, weeks you can tell us all to shut up. Yeah, do the shut up thing. Yeah. See, Bill, so you get a vacation. You don't have to do anything for two weeks. Okay. Alicia Monroe Prime says, love your show. I learned so much. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. Alicia Prime. Alicia Monroe Prime. M Alicia Monroe Prime. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, Xavier Saint Hope points says the Jews were mean. John eight forty one. You're you're doing the works of your father, um, and quotes the rest of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because again, the Jewish leaders of the time were adding to the Old Testament. They weren't just teaching the Old Testament; they were adding a whole bunch of stuff making people's lives miserable yeah and that's what jesus took exception to the additions to the law not the law sure sure um let's You've see i was trying to look at some somebody uh pointed out in in um your 21st century thinker someone's got to be wisconsin uh that uh in in doing what they did they ruined chicago so i don't because yeah. chicago could be part of uh, wisconsin today there you yeah. go there you go there you go a lot of comments about no sound we appreciate people letting us know there was yeah you know we don't get into political stuff but but this i think i've looked at the demographics on this chicago thing if chicago were in wisconsin wisconsin would be a steadily steadily blue state and illinois would be a steadily steadily red state because the thing that makes Illinois a blue state is Cook County, Illinois, and mm. all the suburbs. Mm. You take that and put it in Wisconsin, and all those downstate voters. Go, why are we getting into politics? I don't we, know. We don't take. Uh, we I don't. know this is not, well. That's not really political. That's how. That's how the um, the state lines affected another thing. Yes. So politics right. too. And we're not taking sides on <laughs> they, red they, and blue. We're, they 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 changed economics. They changed yes, they did. wealth and resources, Absolutely. and they changed. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Bill Bratt says in regards to David's letter, the Catholic Church is responsible for the changing of the day of worship. Mm -hmm. And he wrote more too, which you guys can read in in, in the chat room. Okay. Make sure I get that because I might want to use it on uh, next week's show okay. when we talk about David's letter because we're okay. going to talk about David's letter. Okay, Bob Petty points out that various Church of God booklets on the Sabbath are good outlines, mm -hmm. but he thinks Bakioki is the definitive book. What about my thing on my booklet at Church of God International on the uh, Sabbath? Maybe a lot of people don't know about it. Well, let me put a plug in. Okay. Je it, well, you think Jeff won't mind if I put in the plug? I don't think he'll mind. Okay. Uh, I've got a booklet. I've had it out uh, for, like, what is it, three years now over mm -hmm. at CGI. You can write in and just ask him for the booklet about the Sabbath uh, by Wes White. Okay. Or but uh, it's, I think I, that's the only booklet about the Sabbath they have. No, no, they've got they've got one other one. So uh, Vance Stinson wrote it, a and you can get that one too. But I I I know that Bakioki's is better than mine. Oh, okay. Yeah, but does Bakioki have Sabbath school lessons based on his? 
I have no idea. <laughs> but you have Sabbath School lessons based on yours. Brandy Webb wrote them. Brandy Webb wrote them. And I them. believe those are up on the website at CGI also. That's right, they are. Yeah. So you can get those. So a lot of good resources if you want to teach your kids about the Sabbath and yeah. help them learn, or teach a Sabbath school class yeah. about the Sabbath, or a Sunday school class about the Sabbath. Hey, go wild. Yeah, so if you get the Sabbath school lessons that Brandy put together on the subject of the Sabbath, they're on the CGI website. If you lay, it, lay them down side by side with my booklet, you're going to see some remarkable similarities. That's right. Because Brandy used my booklet as a uh, starting point. That's right. So. That's right. I'm trying and to see if she did a great job. Not because she used my stuff. She just did a great job. That's right. Mark Silas explained the hopper to, to young people out there. So if any of you What does young he say people, about the hopper? Uh, well, it's one of those things I can't see. It just keeps trying to make me. Oh, okay. Me. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um... Happy Sabbath from Charles Robert and his two granddaughters. Hey, Charles. And Bob Petty says the, tra tra the transition to Sunday was a late development by Catholic theologians and came about in stages. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, tell David about, uh, Sharon Lewis says, tell David about Rome's challenge to the Protestants. That's a quote, so I don't know. Is that a quote or a book title? Uh, it's in quotes, so it's probably a book title. Yeah, okay. What's the title of the book again? Rome's Challenge to Protestants. Okay, check it out. I'm not familiar with it. Oh, my. And Ryan and Walter were watching tonight. Oh. Ryan posted, Walter says hi. Hi. Hey. Glad you're here. <laughs> All right, if you're still here. If you're still here. Yes, yeah, so, so we had, uh, we, I know we're not doing shout-outs, we're just doing comments, but we don't I have could time help for that one. We are so sorry we don't get to do shout-outs anymore, but we just got too much material. So, but we do want to keep getting your comments and what. Yeah, so we really can read them all later too. You you the, always the go through and read the comments. Yeah, but I like as to well. read them on, on the air. Yeah, 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 I do read them. When the show is over and I crash and burn, I sit in my recliner and I go through every comment, read every comment. So that's I don't right. Miss that's anything. right. All right, and happy birthday! Thank you, Kevin. Okay. It's the twenty eighth, the mm -hmm. big one. The big, the big six zero. The big six zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of hello and thank yous. We're so glad that every single one of you is here. Yes. Whether you're from, could have been part of Wisconsin, Chicago, or uh, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, more local. Whether you know what in the hopper means or not. Whether you're new to the Sabbath or just. Uh, learned a little bit about it tonight, and or, you knew what or been keeping were. it, or, been, or having been keeping it for decades. We're happy that you're here tonight, yes, we are. and we hope that you'll join us in two weeks. I just want to point out that it was not my idea to cancel the program for my birthday, but uh, it was all Wes's idea. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. Yeah, we're going to cancel the program. We we hoped you'd understand and say, oh, okay, it's Nancy's birthday. They're going to be kinfolk in town, or relatives in town for you Yankees. Uh, so uh, we, we hope that you would understand. Because, because again, our thing is we want to be here week after week after week. And there are sometimes we're going to have to cancel, like during the feast and stuff like that. But if we don't have to cancel, we don't want to cancel. We want to be here for you week after week or after week. But we, we need a little break. Okay. Anything else? I think that's, that's no other it. comments. We're going to wrap it up. All right. Shall we have a closing prayer? Let's do. Let's bow our heads, please. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for this opportunity that we had tonight to talk about your word. We thank you so much uh, for all that you give to us and for this opportunity that we have to fellowship, even if it's, if it's electronically. Father, we have people scattered all over the world, and it's hard for us to get together because there are so few of us. We are indeed a little flock. But these electronics do wonderful things, and we thank you for them. They are a blessing, and we're trying to use them for a good purpose to please you. So now we ask for your dismissal. We ask for your blessing on those who will be traveling to go to church tomorrow. Please be with us on this Sabbath day as we show our obedience to you and as we try to demonstrate our love for you. So we uh, ask you for these things. We give you praise and thanks in the name of Jesus. And our last admonition that we have Amen. for you is have, have a, a good Sabbath. Sabbath. And if you're going to be at CGI Tower tomorrow, we'll see you there. We'll see you there. All right. Morris Foster is preaching tomorrow. That's right. My good buddy Morris.